I want to say to everyone, happy Sabbath. We want to welcome you to Sabbath afternoon, festive Sabbath, that we can sit down and worship the Lord together. We realize the time we're living in is solemn and important. Great changes are taking place in our world, and we were told that the final moments would be rapid ones. We see these events taking place, and it behooves us that we take time to seek the Lord and spend time with him in prayer. Before we get started, our subject is Scorched um, Part 2, and we're going to be looking back. We're going to review a little bit with you from what we left off last time, and then we're going to go right into where we're going today. And so I would um, ask you to re think about the things that we went over last Sabbath evening so you can uh, remember so you can understand where we are. If you don't, if you think we're lost, if you're lost in the idea, then you need to look back at the Sabbath, uh, get the Sabbath tape, all right? Or look back at the um, information that was given then. Now at this time, um, we're gonna have a word of prayer and ask God for the Holy Spirit. So I ask you at this time to bow your heads with me as I kneel for prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we approach thy throne of grace by faith in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. We say by faith because you said in your word, now the things we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest that is sat on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens a minister of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. We said we approach the most holy place by faith. When Paul wrote that, Lord, Jesus was in the holy place. But at the end of Daniel 8, 14, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. On October 22nd, 1844, by faith, we follow Christ as a movement. After a great disappointment, we follow Christ into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And so, Lord, we, by faith, believe that this is where Jesus is and where the hour of judgment is taking place and the cleansing of the sanctuary for the blotting out of sin. And so, Lord, we approach thy throne there, and we ask thee to please grant us thy Holy Spirit, and please grant us power and revival with reformation in our lives. Lord, it is, no, it is not mere man that has to present your word, but it's the power and presence of the Holy Spirit that must be present with us as we present it today. And so, Lord, I bow before thee, asking thee to take these feeble lips of dust and clay and use them for your glory. I surrender my will to thee and ask that it be not my words, but thine, and that it be not my mouth, but thy words coming out of my mouth. Lord, as you spoke to prophets of old and put your words in their mouths, Put your word in my mouth. Let me be only an instrument. And I ask this, and we ask this, in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. So our subject is sunrise and scorched. And as you can see, we, have, we had to put some disclaimers up because just recently I got a call from uh, YouTube, where they wanted to take down our video on three steps to Sunday. They wanted to take down the thing all to, they, they, because of the footage that we had in it, not because it was false, but because they they tried to claim a, a copyright infringement. But it was a it was not that in reality because it's something that is public domain. But nevertheless. 
we've had to put make sure I had to be sure about these things. And this was just this past week. So please keep us in prayer because they are monitoring what we're saying. Brothers and sisters, phone lines are monitored as well. Um, I was on the phone line in one particular line. And um, as I was, I went back to look and I realized that the whole thing, not only you recording it for the sake of wanting it for the people to be purchased, but it's being recorded as, as surveyed as information. And so, believe it or not, while you think all these wonderful technologies are wonderful, it is one major surveillance, and we know this. So, brothers and sisters, I'm not, I'm not oblivious to it, but at the same time, God has a message that he wants to get out, and everything is in his hands. So I just want to let you know that before you get, but as you get too attached to these things, because the days are coming when we will no longer be able to do these things that we do now by any of these devices. So God have mercy on us and may we stop taking it lightly and taking it for granted. Now, with that thought in mind, let's go into our subject, Sunrise and Scorched. The before has started. But before we do, we're going to have a song of meditation.
Amen. At this time, let us pray again. Father in heaven, as we open your word now and talk about sunrise and scorched, we ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit. May he abide with us. May he bring all things to our members. May he guide us into all truth and may he show us things to come in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Sunrise and scorched. Now we're going to review a little bit with you so you can remember where we left off in our last study. So let us continue. Now we talked about the issues of Black Lives Matter. And uh, by the way, we're gonna have a, um, a, a series coming up very soon called, uh, on next, probably starting next Sabbath, it'll be dealing with the issue of conspiracy versus truth. Is all, is conspiracy just conspiracy? We're gonna find out. And we're gonna look back at some of these events and others, but we're gonna see for what, is it, what is conspiracy? And how is it really uh, to be examined and deciphered? Because in the last days that men will call evil good and good evil. And the Bible said they will put darkness for light and light for darkness. So brothers and sisters, we need to pay attention very carefully. And we'll see that starting next Sabbath. So I want you to keep that in mind. Right now we're dealing with Black Lives Matter founders and who and who are trained. This is something we talked about last week. And I want you to listen carefully to, again, this point, because we are watching things taking place in our society and in our world, which is directly connected with Bible prophecy. If we study Bible prophecy carefully and we looked at the book of Daniel chapter 11, we will be, really, we will be actually looking at the issues of the king of the north and the king of the south. The king of the north is a symbol of the papacy, and the king of the south is symbolizing the atheistic power that would come on the scene, the beast from the bottomless pit, which would be represented as atheism and as Sodom and Gomorrah. And as we look at these two different characteristics of these two different beasts, the beast from the bottomless pit and the beast of Revelation 13, one, the great antichrist power, the Bible makes it very plain, the scriptures make it very plain that we're dealing with two powers at the end of time. One, atheistic in nature, but with also having the characteristics for the promotion of sodomy, and another group, another one, that is promoting the idea of a church and state relation where the church controls the power of the state. And in sense, and in the, and in the long run, this will happen with the lamb-like beast of Revelation 13, who will say, let us make an image to the first beast who was wounded by the sword and did live, which historically, the, uh, many historians point out, it was the papacy. So now we see the we see in our country and in our world, we're watching the idea of us going from either us moving to two phases, either socialist or at the same time, social doctrine of Rome. All roads will lead to Rome, by the way. And so brothers and sisters, I want you to understand as we look at these issues. And we're gonna find out something very interesting. If you wanna know the true history of, of, of dealing with black people and the fact why your situation is like it is and why certain histories have been kept from you, that you seem to be a people without a nation without a, and without a foundation here in America especially, then what you need to do, the only, the only book that gives you the true history and the true answer to all this is the Bible. And we'll be looking at that also, so on next Sabbath as well. So I need you to keep that in mind, but right now let's review what we were talking about. Many see the slogan Black Lives Matter or BLM as a noble plea for equal treatment under the law. It's a cry to secure the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness for everyone. But what does the Black Lives Matter organization actually stand for? To find out, look no further than their leaders. Alicia Garza, Opal Tometi, and Patrice Cullors. Here's Cullors in a revealing 2015 interview. We actually do have an ideological frame um, myself. And Alicia in particular are trained organizers. Um, we uh, are trained Marxists. 
Visit the Black Lives Matter website and read the list of demands to get a sense of how deep a transformation they seek. One of those demands proclaims, quote, we disrupt the Western prescribed nuclear family structure requirement by supporting each other as extended families and villages that collectively care for one another. We can't be certain, but it's hard to believe this radical agenda is what most signed up for when they made that hashtag Black Lives Matter social media post, or that every employee, customer, or shareholder at Nike endorses a disruption of the family. Garza first coined the phrase in 2013, the day George Zimmerman was acquitted of murdering Trayvon Martin. Her friend Colors added the hashtag and joined the words so it could travel through social media. Tometi created the digital platform blacklivesmatter.com. According to Robert Stilson of the Capital Research Center, the group became a self-styled global network in 2014 and a fiscally sponsored project of a separate progressive nonprofit in 2016. This evolution has helped embolden an agenda vastly more ambitious than a national defunding of police. The goals of the Black Lives Matter organization go far beyond what most people think. They're hiding in plain sight, there for the world to see. If only we read beyond the slogans and the summaries of the movement they helped to create. It's a distinction with a profound difference. Their radical Marxist agenda is bent on supplanting the basic building blocks of society, the family, replacing it with the state, and destroying the economic system that has lifted more people from poverty than any other. Theirs is a blueprint for misery, not justice. It must be rejected. I want you to notice something with me now. I showed that to let you understand what they said. Train what? Train Marxists. Now, did the Bible foretell that Marxism would come into being? Now, in order to notice, because the reason why I'm saying this is because we need to look at things very carefully. Turn me in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 11 for a moment. Revelation chapter 11. And I want you to turn with me there, and I want to show you two things is going to take place that the Bible says that where this ideology is coming from, so you can better understand what the word of God says. In Revelation chapter 11, the Bible says here, and I want you to look here in your Bibles with me, in Revelation 11, and we're gonna start here, uh, and we're gonna look here at verse seven. And when they have finished their testimony, talking about the two witnesses, the two witnesses represent the Old and New Testament. How do we know, why, did the Bible, why are they called witnesses? What do they witness of? In the book of Revelation, remember, everything is written in symbolism. In Revelation chapter one, verses one, the Bible says the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which will shortly come to pass. He sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant, John. He sent and what signified, that means to be put in symbols. Now the symbols can be decoded only as we compare scripture with scripture, line upon line, precept on precept, here a little and there a little. But I want you to remember that here, the two witnesses, what are witnesses? Witnesses give a testimony. What did Jesus say would be his, the thing they would give testimony? Go in your Bibles for a moment to John 5, 39. In John chapter five, verse 39, the Bible says, search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. Notice that the Bible said the scriptures testify of him. Wait a minute, a testimony is a witness. One who test witnesses is one who gives a testimony in behalf of something or someone else. In this case, the scriptures give the testimony of Jesus. Let's see for a moment. Look here in your Bibles at Luke, 20, Luke, Luke 24, 27. Luke 24, 27. And the Bible says in Luke 24, 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all scripture the things concerning himself. Notice here, the Bible said he expounded in what? All scripture, the things concerning himself. Notice that very carefully. And so we find again, the scriptures give the testimony concerning Jesus. And in Luke, um, 
2444. Listen again in Luke 2444 with me, as I want you to see it from the Bible. I don't want to go too fast, but I can't go too slow either. Luke 2444, look what the word of God says here. Luke 2444, the Bible says, and he said to them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled, which was written in the law of Moses, that's the first five books of the Old Testament, and in the psalm and the prophets and the psalms concerning me. So the two witnesses is the Old Testament in uh, Jesus' day, because in Jesus' day, the, this, the second witness had not been, wit had been written yet, and that came by the apostles in the New Testament. So by the time we read about Revelation chapter 11, we read about the French Revolution, and we read about two witnesses that's going to prophesy during this period, and the French Revolution comes almost near the, is coming around almost at the point when the papal supremacy is about to be brought to an end and the papacy is about to receive a deadly wound. So the Bible makes it very plain here that two witnesses will prophesy. And those two witnesses represent the Old and New Testament and God's people who will know the Bible and be prophesying about the things and giving their testimony. Listen very carefully at Revelation chapter 11, verse three, and I will give power to my two witnesses and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred years. It says a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. And so therefore the people of God's word will be persecuted. It would persecute it first by the papacy and then it will be uh, persecuted by another power. Listen to Revelation eleven seven. And when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascended out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome them and kill them. The Bible said the beast from the what? The bottomless pit shall what? Make war. So there's another power now that's going to come out of the bottom pit. A beast from the bottomless pit is going to make war on God's two witnesses. And this power is dealing with the rise of the French Revolution. How do we know that? As Adventists, we know that very clearly from the book Great Controversy. Turn me in your Bible. Turn if you if you have a book, Great Controversy, you can look at it on page 266 with me. Pages 266 and page 269. Pages 266 to 269 says this. Now it says the two witnesses represent in scripture the old and new testament. Both are important testimonies. Now, by the way, it says they both are important testimonies to the origin and perpetuity of the law of God. Both are witnesses also of the plan of salvation. The types, sacrifices, and prophecies of the Old Testament point forward to a savior to come. The gospel and the epistles of the New Testament tell of a savior who has come, and it says, in an exact manner foretold in type and prophecy. They shall prophesy, listen carefully, they shall prophesy, she's quoting Revelation 11, 3, a thousand, Two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. During the greater part of this period, God's witnesses remained in a state of obscurity. The papal power sought to hide from the people the word of truth. Now, notice this: this is in a time when the papal power is in power, and what is the papacy doing? Hiding from people the word of truth. It says, when the Bible was proscribed by religious and secular authorities, when this testimony was perverted and every effort made that men and demons could invent to turn minds of the people from it, when those who dare proclaim its sacred truths were hunted, portrayed, tortured, buried in dungeon cells, martyred for their faith, and compelled to flee to mountain fastness and dens and caves of earth. Then the faithful witnesses prophesied in sackcloth, yet they continued their testimony throughout the entire period of 1260 years in the darkest times there were faithful men who loved the word of god and were jealous for his honor and says to these loyal servants were given wisdom power and authority to declare his truth during this whole time now now let's deal with the faithful witnesses all right now i want you to get this for a moment the two witnesses now let's go over here for a moment and talk about the beast from the bottomless pit it says here watch carefully now this is from the book, Great Controversy, page 269. It says here, and we're looking at the bottom part of the page, if you have the big gold edition, otherwise not, you have to look for it. 
it says here, page 269, it says, when they shall have finished their finishing their testimony, the period when the two witnesses were to prophesy clothed in sackcloth ended in 1798. As they were approaching the termination of their work in obscurity, war was made upon them by the power as represented as the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit. In many, it says in many nations of Europe, the powers that ruled the church and state, listen carefully, in many nations of Europe, the powers that ruled the church and state, that's very important to us here. It says here, had for centuries been controlled by Satan through the medium of the papacy. But here is brought to view a new manifestation of satanic power. We're looking at the history being repeated in our time, right here in America. We're watching these, the, these two, uh, these two powerful, these two prophet powers prophesied of in the Bible, the beast, the papal power, and then this beast from the bottomless pit, which is the rise of, uh, of what we're going to see, Marxism and all the rest. Listen carefully. It had been Rome's policy under a profession of reverence for the Bible to keep it locked down and unknown in an unknown tongue, hidden away from the people. Under her rule, the witness, under her rule, the witnesses prophesied, clothed in sackcloth. But another power, the beast from the bottomless pit, was to arise to be to make open avowed war upon the word of God. Is going to do what? Is going to rise to make open avowed war on the what? Word of God. It says here, going on, it says, the great city in whose streets the witnesses are slain and where their dead bodies lie is spiritually Egypt. Notice carefully, spiritually Egypt. It says here, listen, and why Egypt? Turning your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter uh, five. Go with me there. That's, I believe that's what I want. Go with me to Exodus in your Bible for just a moment. I'm just laying the foundation for what we're reviewing so you'll see why we're reviewing it. And we're not just dealing with the idea of the racial tension that's going on. We're telling you the origin of the movement itself from Bible prophecy so you would know why you are not to have anything to do with these type of things. Look here carefully what the word of God says. And I'm looking here in Exodus right quick. And I want to look here, very Exodus chapter five. And I want you to look here with me in Exodus 5 as we read about Moses and we read something that Pharaoh said. Listen carefully. Now, this is, the, this is going to be the rise of this atheistic power. The Bible is giving you the major characteristic of this power. One of the major characteristics of this power is found in Exodus chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. And afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, thus said the Lord God of Israel. Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. And Pharaoh said, Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice? It says here, it says, I, I know, it says, and let Israel go. I know not the Lord, neither will I let Israel go. Now understand this very carefully. This is this particular Pharaoh that came on the scene, according to Exodus chapter 1. The Bible says something very interesting about this point, and I want to make it very plain to you. All right, now I want you to listen carefully. It says here, the Bible says here, and because the children of Israel were in Egypt because of Joseph. Remember that. Now going back a little bit, because, now listen carefully to this. And verse 6, Exodus 1, 6 says, and Joseph died and all his brethren and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied. Now, I want to show you something very carefully. And waxed exceedingly great, and the land was filled with them. Now there arose with a new king over Egypt who knew not Joseph. There was a new king in Egypt who knew not what? Joseph. And he said unto, the, unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel were more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them lest they multiply, and it come to pass that when they fall out in, a, in a, a, any war, they join also to unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. Now, by the way, they, they, they came up with something, they came up with a new policy, and their new policy 
was like today, but we, they came up with taskmasters over the people. Now, brothers and sisters, I'm bringing this out for a reason. The Bible shows very clearly that there's a power. The beast from the bottomless pit has, the, has a characteristic like Pharaoh of old. He says, who is Jehovah that I shall let Israel go? Now, notice something very carefully with me for just a moment. Just bear with me here for a moment, because I want to make sure I lay this foundation right, because I, we, we're reviewing what we went over last week, and some people want to know why we brought this up, and I want to show you again from the Word of God. And so we're going to find this beast from the bottomless pit has got the characteristics of Pharaoh of an atheistic type view of things that believes that does not acknowledge the living God. You see, Pharaoh in his day believed that he was a god, and the ultimate worship of Pharaoh was the worship of the sun god, Ra. The ultimate worship of the papacy is also the sun god, Ra, if you want to go back to it, because the priests represented the pap The pontiff Maximus was a priest king. He was a priest king of the sun god. So, brothers and sisters, we see that all roads are going to lead to not only Rome, but ultimately all roads are going to lead to the worship and homage to the sun. Watch very carefully. Not the son of God, but to sun worship. We're going to see this. It's only which extreme are you going to take? Are you going to go the way of, 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 of Rome? Are you going to go the way of the socialist Marxist situation? We're going to see that the issue is before us and God is trying to tell us because this nation now is involved in this very same thing. Brothers and sisters, we on the road of one road leads to extreme beliefs of denial of God and his existence. The other road leads to an extreme belief that God does exist and that everything needs to be brought under his control. And yet both roads will lead to the ultimate conclusion of men worshiping the sun and sun worship or Sunday. You're going to see this as we continue on. The oldest of the ancient worships in, the, in times past will be again seen. But now I want to just give you one more point on this, and that's this about this issue. So we got the atheism of Pharaoh. So I want you to go back to the book Great Controversy with me. Great Controversy. And let's look at page 269 right here, 269. And it says here, the great city whose streets were lie. Remember in Revelation 11, 3, go back with me and let's see it. Let's see it from, it says in Revelation 11, 3, the great city in whose streets uh, witness, the witnesses, meaning the word of God, the Old New Testament, and God's people who proclaimed his word, were, are slain and where their dead bodies lie is spiritually Egypt, spiritually Egypt. And we find out Egypt represented what? Pharaoh and his atheism. Of all nations presented in Bible history, Egypt most boldly denied the existence of the living God and resisted his commands. No monarch ever ventured upon more open and high-handed rebellion against the authority of heaven than did the king of Egypt. When the message was brought to him by Moses in the name of the Lord, Pharaoh proudly answered, who is Jehovah that I should obey his voice and let Israel go? I know not Jehovah, neither will I let Israel go. This is, in this final Exodus 5.2, it says, this is atheism. It's what, everybody? Atheism. And the nation represented by Egypt would give voice to a similar denial of the claims of the living God. It says, and would manifest a spirit of unbelief and defiance. Now, listen carefully what will be connected to atheism. It says here, the great city is also compared to spiritually to Sodom, the corruptions of Sodom in breaking the law of God was especially manifest in licentiousness. All right, licentiousness, all right? It said this sin was also to be pre, a preeminent characteristic of the nations, it says here, that should fulfill the pacification of this prophecy. According to the words of the prophet, then a little bit before the year 1798, some power of satanic origin and character would rise to make war upon the Bible. And in the, it says, in, in the land where the testimony of God's two witnesses should thus be silenced, there would be manifest a atheism of Pharaoh, of the Pharaoh and licentiousness of Sodom. The atheism of what? Pharaoh and licentiousness of Sodom. 
Is that why the same movement, Black Lives Matter, also promotes the idea of same-sex agenda? Brothers and sisters, this is Bible prophecy being fulfilled right before our very eyes. And we're looking at the South and we're looking at the North. The North is leading us, the counterfeit king of the North is leading us back to Rome. And the, and the power of the South, which is atheistic communism, is also leading us to a social doctrine that will eventually, communist doctrine, that will also lead us to Rome because it originated from her through the Jesuit order. So brothers and sisters, we see the very thing being brought before our very minds as we go. Now let's continue. Now that we understand this, and I want you to see this, prophecy is being fulfilled right before our very eyes, and we are watching the very sure word because in 2 Peter 1, 19, the Bible says, but we have almost a more, we have more, a most, almost a more, also a more sure word of prophecy that we do well to take heed as a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and day star rise in our hearts. Now let's move on. Now that we understand this issue better from prophecy, now we understand Black Lives Matter's co-founder describes us as a trained Marxist. Not only that, but in the last days, we told, we're told from Revelation 16, 13. Go me to Revelation 16, 13 now. Because now we know that they're Marxists. Now that we know there's a socialist agenda, atheistic in nature, so that's why they can stand in front of churches and, 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 and lambast churches and those leaders in those churches and everything else. Because listen carefully, the Bible says there's something else connected with them. In Revelation 16, 13 and 14, because Marxism is atheism, which is a denial of God, it leads them that you are under the other power. That means you're under satanic and spiritualistic influence. And the Bible says in Revelation 16, verses 13 and 14, and I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out the mouth of the dragon and out the mouth of the beast and out the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth into the kings of the earth and to the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. Ellen White says that Satan is consolidating his forces and through spiritualism, he's creating a bond of sympathy with Rome. Brothers and sisters, he's consolidating his organizations. So Black Lives Matter is now joining with the labor unions and everything else. So what do we see taking place? We are watching the consolidation of satanic forces through and the bond is now spiritualism because there are two major things immortality of the soul and Sunday sacredness. And what does Black Lives Matter teach? Don't they say and teach that they believe in ancestry worship, that your ancestors live on and they pour out libations of wine over the dead? Brothers and sisters, these are all dealing with spiritualism. And this is what the spirit of prophecy set would be. And we can see from the Bible prophecies that this is the bond that brings them together. And the, it's because the latter lays a bond of sympathy with Rome. What is it? Immortality of the soul. Brothers and sisters, we are watching this events taking place. And it behooves us that we understand what the word of God is saying. Let's continue on. We find that Marxism was a supporter of a political and economic theory, Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. And we know that Engels and Marx both denied the existence of the living God. But let's go a little bit closer. I didn't put in Frederick Engels last time, but next time I will, uh, ne uh, next time I uh, will review again, I will bring them in, I will bring his picture in and what he talked about as well. But notice here with me, Marxism is a social, political and economic theory originated with Karl Marx, which focuses on the struggle between capitalists and the working society. You see, in Marxism, they make the, the working society, which is the poor classes that are trying to make it, they make them believe that this is a better system and that it's a commune system where everybody has everything in common. But at the same time, while everything has everything in common, it's a very tyrannical system and despotism. Therefore, it will lead to a worse situation than you ever thought you were under, under capitalism. And if you don't believe that, like I said before, go back and look at China very closely, go back and study the history of Russia under Stalin and Lenin, and then ask yourself and go back and study the French Revolution carefully, get out of the classroom theory that they taught you in humanistic classes in some of our colleges and universities, and go back and do your own homework and study carefully, and you will find, brothers and sisters, that this is something, this is a, this is a system that has failed over and over again, but not without taking thousands and thousands, even millions of people's lives. Brothers and sisters, you need to think again. Look carefully. 
Karl Marx was a Rothschild's third cousin and Christian Zionist. And notice very carefully. And notice very carefully, he has his hand in his pocket indicating that he's part of the secret societies. Brothers and sisters, again, the word of God is clear on this matter. And you can see these previous people who were connected with Marxism. Now, why would Black Lives Matter join Marxism and at the same time be talking about racial detentions in the community, but you are following a a, 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 a organization that was even more racist than you and even can, didn't even like you yourself for that matter and didn't even want to tolerate you to that great, to that great degree, especially if you were not of, this, of a certain car thinking. Brothers and sisters, look carefully. Mao Zedong, Stalin, Lenin, Frederick Engels, and Karl Marx, the founders of racism, but the Bible prophesied of these people the founders of a Marxist communist society, socialist society, the Bible prophesied them as representing the beast, their, their philosophy and their system will be spread to the point it will take over a nation. And it took over, or took over it started in France, but later it, it formed itself more firmly in the Bolshevik revolution of 1917. And so we find here that this is a power, the Bible says, that will be atheistic in nature, and also have the licentiousness of Sodom and Gomorrah. And they would deny the existence of the living God and at the same time run havoc and uh, uh, persecute Christians and those who believed in God. This is historically a fact. Let's continue on. Karl Marx was the Rothschild's third cousin. Now the Rothschilds are the rich elite as we talked about before. The Bible said that the elite in the end time, the wealthy, the aristocratic class, the people who have the money, they can be kings and queens of England. They can be what you call trillionaires, if you will, not just billionaires, but trillionaires. You have the trillionaires, your billionaires, and your millionaires. Brothers and sisters, this is the aristocracy that have the, 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 the one percenters that own, two, two percenters that own most of the world's wealth and they will invest in different groups and organizations to further their ends and to also to protect their own interests. So brothers and sisters, we see this event and we need to understand what we're looking at. It says in order for the true meaning of things not to strike, it says here, no, in order that the true meaning of things may not strike the goem before the proper time, the goem represents you and me, it says here, we shall mask it. In other words, we'll cover it up under the alleged ardent desire for the working class. In other words, we'll make Marxism look like it's the best thing that can help them for working class and also for black people. Let's break it down if we're talking about Black Lives Matter today. And we're gonna connect Black Lives Matter, which is a Marxist organization with the labor union. So the labor unions being connected with the Black Lives Matter is falling right under the plan of, the Roth, of Karl Marx and the Rothschilds. The Rothschilds invest the money, to help the organizations, and then they make sure they can get more money from other organizations and other branches of organizations that they control or have controlling interests or own. And so therefore we see major companies invest in this, in, in, in this so-called Black Lives Matter movement, which is Marxism under the guise of making sure they're working for the, they're masking it under the issue of working for the working classes. But in reality, that's gonna bring you into servitude and slavery and despotism. Let's continue on. And so we find this class worked out, was developed by the Jacobites, and, they, and we talked about the Jacobites. We found out their origin was with the Jesuits who had been suppressed by Rome in 1773. And now suddenly they're, they're, they, they, they were seeking to, they were rising and coming up to power with the vigilante groups of the uh, Jacobites and their philosophy which would later lead to what we see, the French Revolution and the persecution of all religion and uh, even killing of uh, the king and queens of England. I mean, of France at that time, Marie Antoinette and her husband. Let's continue on. Then we found here, and I want you to listen again, so you can remember again a little bit we showed here. As much as I hate the word 
Illuminati because it's very deceptive and it's very cliche to just say, oh, it's Illuminati and not really understand what that means or say, that's that's an Illuminati symbol. <laughs> no, it's not. It's really not. This, this has to do with black magic and Kabbalah type stuff. It, it's for projecting your intent. It's, it's not a symbol for anything else other than that. And sometimes it's a vagina. So, like, when you see uh, Beyonce do that with the microphone through the hole, that's she's talking about sex. It's it's, uh, it's subliminal. So here we go. Origins of May Day. On May 1st, 1776, Adam Weissop, a professor of canon law at the University of Ingolstadt, who was a Jesuit priest, established a secret society in Munich, Bavarian, Bavarian known as the Order of the Illuminati. From that time until today, May Day, which is has its origins in the ancient Rome, right? So now we're talking about May Day, May 1st, the most beloved day in communism. Catching that? And where Adam Weissop and his ideas and this Illuminati, this is where this is coming from, okay? Karl Marx just put his, 72 years later, did his own thing with this information, but it wasn't him specifically. All right, this was just all Jesuit carried out. So, which has its origins in ancient Rome, has been observed as an international holiday by socialists, communists, and by other so-called progressives. Yeah, progressive is a very bastardized word, isn't it? So is liberal. The modern origin of May Day is well known as and is viewed as accepted history in Europe, yet the origins of May Day, which commemorates the founding of the Illuminati, is virtually unknown to Americans. Adam Weissap described the immediate goal of the secret society, originally called the perfectibilists, as nothing short of the ab abolition of the monarchies and religion in Europe. So destroy the monarchies and destroy religion. That's selective, and this has to do with church indoctrination. So that what they're doing is they're used. The church decided that monarchies weren't as efficient as they used to be because of the Reformationist movement and the the breaking down into Protestantism and all this stuff and human realizing that they have inborn rights. This was not this was not jiving with the Roman Catholic Church. So their way of firing the monarchies was to create communism as this new wave of a different type of religion that would go out and just destroy nations. It's a nation destroyer. So that's that's where this comes in. They got their pink slip by being murdered. That's how the monarchies were replaced. The ultimate goal of the Illuminati, a goal to be achieved gradually, was what Weissop, who used to name Spartacus, just like that retard in New Jersey, in his secret society, referred to in his writings as the creation of a new world order. The Illuminati, then, like the left today, was largely made up of wealthy aristocratic types and middle-class intellectuals, those to whom we now refer to as the top 1% and their supporters. They also infiltrated all the Ivy League schools and created their own brainwashing uh, curriculum to go along with it, so that if you get selected for these schools, chances are you're being groomed for some position in this agenda. The exclusive club back then, as it does today, marketed itself as the champion of the poor while gradually gathering the strands of wealth, power, and influence in their own hidden hands. After its 1776 founding, which was ironically the same year as the issuance of the Freedom-Oriented American Declaration of Independence, the Illuminati spread rapidly across Europe by means of its initiates infiltrating and attempting to dominate the already existing and generally conservative Freemasonic lodges of the major European cities. Infiltrated. Okay? And I just want to come out here and just say this right now. Uh, let's see if it's up here. Where am I? Is it on this side? Should be. Alright, maybe I don't have it up yet. But, there is correspondence between oh yeah it's right here here we go between reverend george washington snyder and president george washington where he's trying to snyder is trying to urge washington to take a closer look at these lodges and you say no i i i don't i want to stop here for just a moment it's much more uh to say show show with this because it's like 30 minutes and everything else but i don't have enough time to do that today right now but what I want you to just understand was he gave you the origin of the Illuminati and communism. And he showed that communism was connected to the Illuminati and the Illuminati was started by the Jesuits and under Adam Weishaupt. 
and they were connected to the capital, the, the, the elite rich, the capitalists or the aristocracy. And so as we can see in the last days, this is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy again, because now we see the rich connected with socialism, which will become the factor of finances for this issue. And then we also see that this, uh, that 1776 May Day has its origin with ancient Rome. And ancient Rome is, was succeeded with papal Rome. And we're gonna see that all this is connected. So brothers and sisters, I, I, I want you to see with me, we're not making things up. We're not exaggerating. This is a fact. And we know that the historical, we have enough books and information on it to show that this is so, but it's a fulfillment of Bible prophecy as Bible prophecy prophesied this beast from the bottomless pit, which is actually, which is known as communism or atheism, which was actually started by Jesuitism as a new power that would make war on God's two witnesses, the Bible. And we see that taking place right now. And we see it happening, developing, is happening in different places of the world. Here in America, we see, a, we see this divide taking place and we're gonna see later on that this is gonna be a war against God's word and true Christianity. Brothers and sisters, true Bible believing Christianity. So let's continue on. Jacobins, it says a member of a democratic club. Now I want you to notice carefully, carefully listen to the name, listen where the origin is. It says a member of a democratic club established in 1789. The Jacobins were the most radical and ruthless of political groups formed in the wake of the French Revolution. It says in association with Robespierre, they instituted terror in 1793. That's just a few years before the papacy receives a deadly wound under Napoleon. But I want you to notice very carefully. Now, just want you to just notice very carefully about that so you can get a good picture of it. Now, now that you understand the Jacobins of the French Revolution, the French Revolution failed. And so later the Jacobin Revolution or the French Revolution, the teachings of that revolution found its way in Russia by 1917. And Russia that was once a republic became an atheistic society, uh, an atheistic government society where communism ruled with an iron fist. And many of the Christians that were in that in the Kerensky's Republic were sent and killed. And many of their children were re-educated in the schools to adore communism. And then Lenin, and, and, and uh, Stalin. Let's continue, this is facts of history. In Matthew 24, seven, the Bible said, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom and there shall be famines and earthquakes. We're pestilence, as we talked about earlier, pestilence are diseases. A pestilent disease, a, pe pe a pestilential disease, it says is an acute malignant and contagious disease that often prevails in Egypt, Syria and Turkey. It says and has at times infected large cities of Europe with frightful mortality, with many people dying, in other words. It goes on and says, pestilence producing. What is a pestilence? Producing or tending to produce infectious disease, a fatal epidemic disease, especially bubonic plague as an example. It says here, what is an epidemic? A widespread occurrences of infectious diseases in a community at a particular time, like a flu epidemic. A pandemic of a disease is prevalent over the whole country or world. And right now we're looking at, and we're still dealing with the effects and issues of a pandemic around the world. And yes, you can see different ones have tried to come, have come on the scenes from SARS to Ebola, but we've had many of this epidemics, but now of course this coronavirus is supposed to be a pandemic. This is a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. Workers across the U.S. plan to stage mass walkouts. We talked about that last week. Let's continue on. And then we found out here that we talked about here about the issues of different ones, different unions coming together. Presidents and service workers and employees represent over 2 million workers in U.S. and Canada. We talked about that. They were talking about what they want to do. I don't want to go into a lot of detail with that. We know that uh, they're dealing with the issue of here. One thing, it says the workers, worker unions, uh, has partnered with the International Brotherhood of Teamsters and the American Federal Federation of Teachers and United Farmer Workers, it says, and fight 
for fifteen dollars uh, an hour and a union which was launched in 2012 by the American fast food workers to push for higher minimum wages. So now notice very carefully, notice it's social and radical justice groups taking the part on March, it says include March on the public, I'm sorry, March on the center of popular democracy. It says here the National Domestic Workers Alliance and the Movement for Black Lives, a coalition of over 150 organizations that make up Black Lives Matter's movement. So we see Black Lives Matter movement as bonding with the labor unions, which we were told the labor unions would be one of the major unions that would bring on a time of trouble, such as there was, which I shared with you last, last after, Sabbath afternoon. This is notice again, these are major brands donating to Black Lives Matter's movement. Now, who are these major brands? Now remember, the major brands are controlled by the elite rich that we talked about, that we talked about. And we showed how the Rothschilds are connected to the socialist movement. But also the Rothschilds are going to find out they're also connected with Rome. We're going to see that too. So brothers and sisters, we're watching two sides of a coin leading to one place being played out with Hungarian dialectic involved. Listen very carefully. Technolo technological companies that are connected with Black Lives Matter. Listen to this. Many large tech companies in the US have donated substantial sums of, to the cause. Google has donated what? 12 million. Uh, Facebook and Amazon have donated 10 million. Apple is pledging a whopping 100 million for a new radically, for a new uh, racial e equity it says here, and justice initiative. Now, brothers and sisters, I want you to see, Walmart announced that it will contribute 100 million. Now you need to ask yourself one other question. These big companies, who owns them? Because once you find out who owns these companies, you begin to understand that the elite rich, the two percenters, one, the one percent of the population that owns most of the world's wealth, control and, 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 are, and are the ones that are over these companies, ultimately. Listen carefully, Target announced 10 million. Brothers and sisters, this is going to an organization. This is not going to people in the community. This is not going to small businesses or different places like that. It's going to an organization that has proven itself to be radical and anti-republic, anti which, which was a foundation for capitalism in the first place. A lot of people mouth and, and put down the idea of America and capitalism. Yes, capitalism has its corruption, but capitalism itself provided for you to come out of being poor and get, allow your middle-class status, where if you, if you follow the previous old world feudalism, you would never be nothing but a poor person, dirt poor, subjected to the kings and queens of England. They're subjected to the oligarchy, the, uh, the aristocracy. And yet people, yes, capitalism could have been, should be, could, could be brought up, but the bottom line, capitalism has its foundation with Protestantism and the moral law of God. But many people who practice business do not bring the law of God into their business. Therefore, they have corrupted themselves by trying to do capitalism in a secular manner without God. And brothers and sisters, in reality, capitalism works better when men and women are truly converted and, and are submitted to God. But at the same time, it allows for you to be poor and you can actually become middle class or even rich. And that was part of the American dream. Now remember what we're saying now, keep this in mind. Let's continue on. We got gaming companies that are also donated 250 million, uh, million here, about 250,000 here, and uh, from one game and company, and one million from another. Let's continue. And so Mayor Rothschild, who was he? I want you to watch this carefully for a moment. Again. The Jewish Encyclopedia tells us in 1905, it is a somewhat curious sequel to the attempt to set up a Catholic competitor to the Rothschilds, that at the present time the latter of the guardians of the papal treasure, 
The use of the word guardians obviously implies the Rothschilds do not personally own that wealth, but are merely keepers of it. Mayor Amschel Rothschild, with his access to Hess Hanover's vast wealth, and conceivably that of the Jesuits as well, had power to effect a credit reduction in British banking. Notice that Mayor Rothschild, the founder of the banking dynasty, was always making use of someone else's money. Knight of Malta, Rothschild was merely under orders of the Jesuit general. During the spring of 1772, the circumspect young Jesuit professor, John Carroll conveyed to the powerful young Jewish banker, Mayor Amschel Rothschild, Lorenzo Rishi's need for a financial disturbance in England and America. Lorenzo Rishi of course being the superior general of the Jesuit order, otherwise known as the Black Pope at the time, continuing. Didn't John Carroll admirably serve his superior general, his church, and his country? And didn't Rothschild do his client likewise? Here we have a Rothschild meeting with a Jesuit professor, and no doubt covertly doing the work of the Jesuit order. We've already established that much of Mayor Rothschild's finance was not personally his. He was merely a keeper of imperial and Jesuit wealth. Bill Hughes, tells us in his book, The Secret Terrorists. The Rothschilds were Jesuits who used their Jewish background as a facade to cover the sinister activities. The Jesuits, working through Rothschild and financier Nicholas Biddle, sought to gain control of the banking system of the United States. How many times in history have we seen the Jesuits covertly working through some group or another? What would indicate the Rothschilds are any different? You can pause the video and read each one of these quotes for yourself. You can pause the video and read each one of these quotes for yourself. However, there is simply no denying the fact that the Jesuits of Rome had the satanic hands all over Mayor Rothschild, the founder of the banking dynasty. There is no denying that much of his so-called wealth was not even his personal wealth but rather he was entrusted with the wealth as a guardian. This Knight of Malta would have five sons who continued the legacy of being subordinate to the papacy, evident by the rewards and knighthoods. All evidence points to the fact, the Rothschild family, being the court Jews that they are merely bankers for the Jesuits. Now, brothers and sisters, if you didn't believe that this was true, I'd like for you to go back in your Bibles with me for just a moment. I want to show you that the Bible links the Rothschilds to the papacy, but not by calling them Rothschilds. Look carefully in your Bible, Ooh, Revelation with me. Turn me to Revelation chapter 18. In Revelation chapter 18 in your Bible, I want you to see with me. The Bible calls it something very carefully. The Bible is talking about the fall of Babylon, and it talks about what was in Babylon, all right? The Bible shows that through her find that the papacy would have, in the book of Daniel chapter 11, the Bible foretells that she would have control of all the gold and silver. That's talking about finances. It's talking about stocks. That's talking about commerce, brothers and sisters. It's talking about trade but that she would have this trade with the help of the merchants of the earth. Listen very carefully to Revelation 18, looking at verses 10 and 10 through 13. And standing afar off for fear of her, or fear of, their tor of her torment, saying, at last, at last, the great city, Babylon, now this is mystery Babylon the great, the mother of Hollis and the abomination of the earth of Revelation 17, 5, which is a symbol of Rome, papal Rome, listen carefully, the system and how they govern, listen carefully, it says here, and it says the merchants of the earth shall wax rich, shall weep and mourn over her. All right, I'm sorry, let me go back up here. And standing afar off for fear of her torment, alas, alas, a great city, Babylon, that says that mighty city, for one hour is thy judgment come. 
and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her. Merchants are rich men. Merchants are the rich men. Found in James chapter two, go to now you rich men, weep and howl for your misery to come upon you. The rich referred to in your Bible, in the Greek, the rich are the wealthy, the opulent, the affluent men of the earth. Listen carefully. They are known as the merchants of the earth. They are known as the great men of earth because they, they, they amass wealth and fortune through trade. Listen carefully in commerce and stock exchange. Brothers and sisters, listen. It says here, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her for no man buy of her merchandise anymore. And the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones, of pearls and fine linen, of purple and silk and scarlet, of thine wood and all manners of thine vessels of ivory and all manners of vessels of the most precious wood and of brass and of iron and marble and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men. Listen carefully, verse 15 goes on and says here, the merchants of these things which were made rich by her stand afar off for fear of her torment, weeping and wailing. Brothers and sisters, listen very carefully. The Bible foretold and shows the link between the rich, the merchants of the earth with Babylon, mystery Babylon, the papacy, the great whore, Revelation 17. Listen very carefully. The Bible said they will be united. And then in verse 23, it says, and the light of the candle shall no more shine at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be no more be heard in thee. For thy merchants, the rich, were our what? The elite, the, the affluent, the oligarch, the aristocracy, whatever you want to call it. Thy merchants were the great men of earth. Now listen what the Bible said they're going to do and where they're going to put their investment in the last days. It says here, for by thy sorceries, the word sorceries is the word pharmakia. The Bible says that they will use sorceries. They will use pharmakia. They will use the pharmacy or pharmaceutical to what? By, by this, all nations, spiritualism with this as well, all nations were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and of the saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. And so we see the rich elite connected with Babylon, connected with mystery Babylon. And in some cases, her daughters, Apostate Protestantism in high places, some of them are contacted. I want you to see. I just want you to see with me. So let's take a look again as we continue. The Rothschilds, at, it says that at the present time, the latter are the what? Guardians of papal treasury. So we see the elite. Is connected just like the Bible said. They were called the Bible didn't call them Rothschilds. The Bible called them the merchants of the earth. Weep. They were made rich by her, and that's what we saw in that in that clip that we saw as well. Brothers and sisters, let's go a little closer. And we see the Paris Agreement and climate change, and we find here that Paris Agreement on climate change is a triumph in diplomacy. At its best, diplomacy enables countries to find the common good. Just as the politics at its best enables a single society to find the common good, the success of the new agreement will depend on whether diplomacy and politics can defend the common good against the ever-present tendencies towards corruption and confusion. Now remember, our subject is dealing with scorched at sunrise, sunrise and scorched. But the whole idea is I'm trying to show you the events that's leading up to it and even the most recent things that we are watching with the coronavirus. And we can see now Revelation chapter 11 kicking in. We see the issues of the relationship between the rich and the, the merchants of the earth and mystery Babylon. The Bible shows you the source. God gets right to the heart of the matter and shows you behind the scene and scenes of counterplay and this organization, that organization, long ahead of that, God puts his finger right on the very pulse 
of who is behind it. And he's showing you that the powers that be are the same powers that are found religion on one hand and political on another hand, are all roads are leading back to Rome. Look very carefully at what the word of God says. And look here, but the common good, what is the common good? Where's all this heading to? The nations are deceived. The nations will be deceived by, by the merchants of the earth, along with the mystery Babylon, who the nations are deceived. The nations need money, brothers and sisters. And in political circles, one of the most, one of the most, uh, in, uh, most uh, common things to get nations to subsist, to uh, submit, is to offer them money or, or take away their funding if they don't do what the elite want in their investment programs. Brothers and sisters, we're gonna see that this issue of buying and selling and controlling all the means of the money is gonna become a very serious one. And we are developing that as we talk. It's developing as we talk. We're seeing it develop in the world. We're watching the whole world's economy. We're looking at 125 million, I mean, we're looking at millions of people unemployed. And we're gonna see that the churches and also that the Different religions are also in on cashing in on this coronavirus issue and receiving monies from the governments or from the states and to the and 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 large sums of it for that matter, which could be why they're content with the idea of letting the churches remain closed. Because if you're receiving money, you are not going to bring up any protest or you're not going to bring up any grievance about the idea that your church is closed. You're going to be sitting there somehow, let's cooperate. Brothers and sisters. Under the in America, you may not be able to do this in other countries, but in America so far, you still have your amendment that says Congress should make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibit the free exercise thereof. Today, we let the health, the concern of health, override the issue of your right to assimilate. Now, it may sound foolish on one hand for me to say that, because some of you would say, well, wait a minute. Why, how, why are you saying that? Don't you know we got a virus out here and it's contagious and everything else? Yes, but it's a funny thing that the churches were not made essential. And yet they tell you if you do it, you got to have only 10 people or 25 people. You can't sing, can't do none of this. So brothers and sisters, what are you watching? Are you looking at a republic? Are you looking at what your founding fathers had? Is this constitutional? Or is it being under overrided through a state of emergency. This is what the Bible says that we will be dealing with in the end time. And we are watching these developments taking place for the reshaping of society to bring in Revelation 17, when the Bible says, listen carefully, the Revelation 17, 13, these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. Who's the beast of papacy? What does the papacy want? I'm getting to the source of the matter. The Bible says no matter how much intrigue you're watching, no matter how much of a different devi deviations you're looking at, the ultimate issue is going to lead back to the very thing that the third angel's message points to, and that's going to point you back to the issue of the issue of a worship. Look at the next, watch, with, watch the next point with me right quick. It says here, in respecting religious liberty, the common good of all Christians should seek the recognition of Sunday as a and church holi holy days as legal holidays. So the issue is going to take us back to what? With climate change and the common good, it's going to take us back to Sunday. And Sunday is going to be connected with what? The coronavirus and you not being a buy and sell. The coronavirus is laying the foundation. And even on the coronavirus, people are saying that we need to rest more. Now that people are in shelter in place, the, econ the, the, the environment's better. The environment now is being exalted over people. In other words, the environment and is more important than the people. In the word of God, people are more important than the environment. Jesus died for people. But now we're looking at a situation where the environment is more important than the worship of nature is more important than the people. To the point we can even think about ridding the earth of millions of people. This is the time we come to. Look a little closer with me. 
do you really want to live without Sunday, without a day where we don't work? This is a European alliance or the European Union saying this. But it's not coming, right? We got time, right? I don't think so. You better wake up and see what time it is. Let's go a little closer. The Bible says Catholic bishops urges UK to preserve Sunday as a day of rest. This was June 22nd, last month. It says a bishop has urged that Christians speak out against plans to relax Sunday trading laws. They're worried about Sunday trading laws, but they're not worried about the churches opening up the right way. So at the same time, while you shelter in place, they're pushing for Sunday observance, and they're saying this is a good time now to push Sunday rest and trading laws on Sunday. We'll relax that now in America and other places where, they, where they're so caught up in making, doing business. But to pay attention, to give homage to Sunday would tell us something, listen very carefully, as economically, as the economy reels from the effects of the coronavirus pandemic, as we emerge from the lockdown, it is regrettable that government is considering removing the remaining legal protections of Sunday in order to make it a full trading day. This is Bishop uh, Strewberry said. So notice very carefully here, but what does the Bible say? What does history tell us about Sunday? Let's see. Again, we have here, listen to another French bishop, listen, French bishops conference headed Archbishop Eric uh, Mullins uh, uh, Be uh, Belfort, it says here has, uh, Buford uh, has said the recent pandemic shutdown had shown both the planet and its people the need of real day, a real day of rest, a real day of what? A real day of Sunday rest, a real day of Sunday rest and suggested France uh, designate one Sunday a month as a lockdown day. One Sunday a month as a what? Lockdown day. But we know now that Rome is connected to the elite rich and the merchants of the earth are also pushing forward as we've seen in the other video clips we've shown on three steps of Sunday. But notice very carefully, responding to the president, Emmanuel Marcom, it says calls for faiths to share their past lockdown reflections. He said the 10, it said the 10 weeks of suspended time has made people realize how modern life leads to constant acceleration of time. French bishop, French our bishop calls for monthly lockdown Sunday. This is in France, but it's coming to America very soon. Just keep it in mind. Power of love and the need to rest. June 26th, we talked about this article. Let's continue. Historically note, Sunday is purely a creation of the Catholic Church. The American Catholic Quarterly, January 1883. Sunday is the law of the Catholic Church alone. This is from American Sentinel, Catholic, June 1893. This again, from Sydney, Australia, Catholic Press. Sunday is a Catholic institution. Its claims to observance can be defended only on Catholic principles. From the beginning to the end of scripture, there is not a single passage that warrants the transfer of the weekly public worship from the last day of the week to the first day of the week, or to the first. So notice we care, this is from Catholic Press, Sydney, Australia, August 1900. So we find again that Cap this Sunday is purely a Catholic institution. Now, if it's a Catholic institution, that means it doesn't have this necessary foundation in the Bible. But can we be sure? Because Catholics follow tradition. And they say that the church, that tradition is above scripture. And Jesus condemned those that follow tradition because the scribes and Pharisees follow tradition. In Mark chapter four, time fly when you're having fun, but look carefully. In Mark chapter four, listen carefully. And um, that Mark, Mark, uh, seven, seven thing. Let me see which one is that. Mark said Matthew seven. Let me see. I'm looking for here. And uh, Jesus talked about the issue, and he talked about uh, how men worship tradition. And so it's very important for us to keep in mind that uh, that we do not exalt tradition above the word of God. Let's go a little bit closer, and we'll see more. Mark 7, 7. 
Is that Mark 7 7? Let me make sure, make sure I got that right while I'm looking at that for a moment. Mark 7 7, as we come down to our point here. I want to make sure I give you the right text on that because it's very important for you to understand. Um, Mark 7 7 says here, albeit in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines and commandments of men. For the laying aside of the commandments of God, ye hold to your tradition, traditions of men, as the washing of pots and cups and many other such things ye do. And he said unto them, Full well ye reject the commandment of God, that ye may keep your own traditions. And so God condemns the idea, Jesus condemned the idea of men exalting traditions above God, his word, or his commandments. Listen carefully. Sunday will bring a bring on the day of the Lord. What is the phrase? What, what is this phrase, the day of the Lord referring to? In Zephaniah 1.15, it says, that day is a day of wrath, a day of trouble and distress, a day of wasteness and desolation, a day of, of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, a day of trouble and a day of wrath. What brings the day of wrath? What brings the wrath of God? Revelation 14, 9 says, and a third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark and his forehead in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he should be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. So let's see right quick as we come down to our closing point. It says here, the mark of the beast, who is, remember, the day of wrath will be brought on by the mark of the beast. All right, so wait a minute. The, who worship the image? The image is the union of church and state, but the mark we're going to find is dealing with Sunday sacredness. Watch a little closer. Who will make the image of the beast? Who will make it? Throughout, it says, answer, the U.S. How do we know? This says, through, the church, through church and state in her legislative halls and courts. The speaking of a nation is the action of its legislative and judicial authorities. By such action, it will be it will give the lie to those liberal and peaceful principles which has been which has put forth, which it has put forth as a foundation of its policy. The prediction that it will speak as a dragon and in exercise all the power of the first beast plainly foretells the development of the spirit of intolerance and persecution that was manifest by the nations represented by the dragon and the leopard-like beast. It says, and the statement that the beast with two horns cause of the earth and them which dwells therein to worship the first beast indicates that the authority of this nation, talking about the U.S., is to be exercised in enforcing some observance which shall be an act of homage to the papacy. A nation speaks through her laws. Now we watch this, but let's go a little closer as we see. Historically, what does the number 666 mean? Now, I need to stop here because our time is up, but we're going to stop here and we're going to come back this afternoon and we're going to deal with the issue of the issue of 666 and we're going to go into it into this issue more. And we're going to look a little closer at this and I don't but I, I don't want to take you too far cuz our time is up and I want to be sure that you understand. I want you to go back and remember the beast from the bottomless pit is represented as the as the as the as the, as represented by the atheistic power. It's also represented in Bible prophecy as the king of the south. And we find that the king of the north is the papacy. And we can see these two elements that's found in Daniel 11, the philosophies are being played out right here in America today as we speak. But all roads will lead back to Rome. And we're going to come back this afternoon and talk about this issue of 666. But brothers and sisters, I make this appeal to you based on the third angel's message. Remember, you need the righteousness of Christ to be able to stand in these last days. In order for you and I to stand correctly, in order for you, to, you and I to stand unequivocally on the present truth for this time, we need to know Jesus for ourselves. The issue of the mark of the beast is coming. The issue of you not being a buy and sell is developing. Brothers and sisters, we need to be in Jesus. We need to know Jesus. 
and be in Jesus. We need grace today because only the grace of God can keep you. Only the grace of God can help you find your way. If you're, if you, if you're confused right now, if you're in a state where you don't really know if you should follow Jesus or not, then I'm, I'm going to ask that you would pray that God would give you grace because you're going to need, we're going to need the grace of God. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves as any man should boast. Brothers and sisters, the things we are watching, the elite rich of the world, forming, the, helping to form and financing the new world order, which is going to give all their power and strength to the papacy. We see all this happening, the beast power. We see what the Bible says is going to happen. The word of God is fulfilling accurately. We have a more sure word of prophecy that we do well to take heed as a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in our hearts. And so because of this, I'm, I'm appealing with you this, this evening, this afternoon, this um, here, that you pray and ask God for grace. We need grace. We need the grace and pop, the provision of God, Holy Spirit in our lives. We need the character of Jesus because there's no other way you can stand against the power that is coming unless you are truly have received of the grace of God. Because if you don't have the grace of God, you cannot find your way. If we don't have the grace of God, we wander down roads that go to nowhere. When we don't have the grace of God, we lean upon salvation by works as though our own salvation could save us. Brothers and sisters, we need grace. We need the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God in our hearts. And we can receive that by faith and love for Christ. So with that thought in mind, won't you listen to this song of appeal song and we'll come back and pray. Love would cost 
Let us pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus and his work as our great high priest. But the Bible said, let us come boldly before the throne of grace so we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Father, we thank you that Jesus' grace is available. Please grant us more of your Holy Spirit and grant that we will work out our salvation with fear and trembling and purify our souls in obeying the truth. Lord, we see the fulfillment of Bible prophecy before our eyes. You thank, we thank you for the sure word of prophecy that points with unerring accuracy the very source of the things that are taking place and how they and the glamorous that are working with it. Father, we thank you for this. But now, Lord, we ask that you will help us make the preparation necessary because we know that these are the signs that point to Christ's return. And we know that soon the marvelous working of Satan will come, Lord, who will deceive the whole world and make them believe that Christ has come. Father, we ask thee, please help us to have our minds fortified with the word of truth. Help us to have Christ-like characters in our mind and, and be filled with thy Holy Spirit and with the fruits of the Spirit, one towards another. Help us, Lord, to have the burden for souls to warn our fellow men and women of the impending danger that is taking place and that everyone can make a decision for this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached throughout the world as a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. Father, be with us, guide us, help us, and above all, Lord, save us. We ask in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Thank you.